Hi everyone and uh, welcome. Uh, my name's James. I'm the distillery brand ambassador. I'm delighted uh, that you've joined in uh, for this virtual tour. Uh, I'm in the finishing room, our upstairs private bar where we host a lot of master classes and tasting sessions and events. Uh, at the moment, it's pity that you can't be here in the distillery, but hopefully I'll be able to bring the distillery to you at home. But uh, yeah, basically uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a virtual tour. We have a great platform, uh, kind of scoot around the distillery, get right into it. And what we're going to do is explain who we are at Teeling Whiskey, but then also go into... Uh, how we make whiskey and how we have set up our distillery to be a flavor forward kind of liquid lead uh, distillery. But uh, yeah, I'll uh, jump on through. Also, if you have any questions throughout or anything like that, uh, please jump on the live chat. We'll have someone from Teeling Whiskey there throughout the entirety to uh, answer all of your questions. But yeah, sit down and hope you enjoy. So I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. That is the distillery there. So if you're interested where I am, I am up here, up in the lovely balcony that I'm looking at uh, now at the moment. And it is actually just as sunny as it is in uh, the picture here. But uh, yeah, this is uh, Newmarket Square. So this is right in the center of Dublin City. Uh, Stevens Green, uh, City Center, Trinity College is all about a 10 minute walk this direction. So we truly are an uh, urban whiskey distillery. But uh, we set this up in 2015. That's when we actually opened our distillery. And we're five years old now. And it's been a tremendous five years uh, going from where the Irish whiskey sector was years ago to where it is now uh, has been incredible. Uh, but yeah, sure, we'll jump on through. So this is our reception area. So when you actually come to the distillery, uh, we do guided tours. We also have a cafe over here for the locals. We get a lot of dog walkers in and people from the community uh, coming in to say hello, grab some lunch and meet up. Uh, a lot of offices and businesses uh, have their meetings and just kind of their lunch in there. Uh, but whiskey is our focus. So uh, usually you'll be here, you'll be greeted by a receptionist and you'll pick your tour uh, we have a multitude of different tours all the way from people looking for a good experience right down to the kind of in-depth master classes as well. So uh, we cater for every type of person. But uh, yeah, I'll jump on through. So basically set this up in 2015 and we actually set this up and we were the first new whiskey distillery to open in Dublin in 125 years. Uh, so we were actually the only people distilling in Dublin for a while. And uh, it's a pity because Dublin has such a rich whiskey distilling heritage. So what you can see here is not the Bermuda Triangle. This is the Golden Triangle. It's what we call it here in Dublin. And this was a triangle of whiskey distilleries. Uh, during the 17th and 18th century, there would have been about 37 distilleries here operating, and they would have outputted around 60% of the global trade. So Irish whiskey was the dominant force globally. Uh, but unfortunately, that whole industry came to a halt. So we went from 37 distilleries to uh, approximately none, uh, if you want to be direct. And we went from, no one really knows the full amount of distilleries operating in Ireland, but we went to two single whiskey distilleries. And what's left in Dublin of these distilleries is very few bits and bobs scattered around the city. The kind of most famous one would be St. Patrick's uh, kind of tower here uh, that has survived. But
Hi guys and welcome. Uh, my name's James. I'm the distillery brand ambassador for Teeling Whiskey. Uh, I'm in the finishing room, our private bar where we host masterclasses and tastings and events at the moment. Uh, but the plan of attack today is to bring the distillery to your home. Uh, we're going to do a virtual tour and this is where I'm going to go explain the history of Dublin and Irish whiskey briefly, but we're going to get into the actual whiskey distillery and explain what we do here in Newmarket Square. So uh, hope you enjoy. Uh, if you have any questions throughout, please hop on the live chat, um, ask away. We'll have someone there from Teeling Whiskey to answer any questions you may have. Uh, and hopefully in the near future, we'll actually get you to come into the distillery and experience all of the sights and the sounds and the smells and uh, definitely the warmth of the whiskey distillery here in Dublin. But but uh, yeah, guys, I'm going to jump on straight to it. So this is our whiskey distillery here. So this is Teeling Whiskey Distillery. Uh, we opened this in 2015. And as you can see, we are in the heart of Dublin. We're about 10 minute walk from everywhere in Dublin. Um, we are an urban whiskey distillery. And uh, yeah, we opened this in 2015. We're five years old now, and it's been an amazing five years um, seeing where the Irish whiskey industry has gone and seeing how we've gone from five years ago all the way to where we are today. So uh, yeah, I'm going to jump on through. Uh, so this is our reception. Usually you pop on up, you'd talk to one of the receptionists that help you pick a tour. We do many different types of tours all the way from... Uh, kind of uh, whiskey and a cocktail into your kind of really premium uh, whiskey masterclasses. So we try to cater for all types of people. So here is our exhibition space. This is where we'd kind of explain the history of Irish whiskey and explain who we are and what Irish whiskey is. But uh, yeah, this area is uh, steeped in whiskey distilling heritage. Uh, this here is called the Golden Triangle. It's not the Bermuda Triangle. This is a whiskey distilling triangle. And in this area, it's known as the Liberties area of Dublin, there would have been 37 active distilleries operating in this triangle here. And that would have happened around the 17th, 18th, up to the 19th century. A monumental amount of alcohol being made here in Dublin, and especially in the area where our distillery is located, called the liberties. Why was whiskey distilling so popular here in this triangle? It was popular because this area lay outside the city walls. So this is where all the dirty work happened, the tanneries, the kind of manure yards, the stables, metal workers, carpentry uh, work, uh, kind of workshops and that. This is where all the dirty, gritty work happened that created revenue, created money and income for Dublin City. So people had a lot more freedom. They were at liberty to do what they wanted to do outside the city walls. So Irish whiskey dominated the world. We had the biggest whiskies distilleries in the world here during the 17th and 18th century. But unfortunately, the entire industry collapsed. So number of reasons. So it collapsed due to World War I, World War II, prohibition in the United States, the reluctance of the Dublin distillers to embrace new technology and uh, Irish independence as well. So it went from 37 active distilleries to none in Dublin city centre. And we went from approximately, no one really knows actually how many legal and illegal whiskey distilleries there were in Ireland, but we went to two whiskey distilleries uh, by the 1980s. So where did we come in? So we opened this whiskey distillery in 2015 and we were opened by Jack and Stephen Teeling, two brothers. So we are still to this day a family owned independent Irish whiskey distillery. And Jack and Stephen would have gotten their experience in the father's whiskey distillery, running that and getting uh, a lot of experience, expertise and knowledge of the Irish whiskey sector and the global whiskey sector. So they decided to open the family whiskey distillery and revive whiskey distilling in Dublin and then also revive whiskey distilling under the family brand, the Teeling Whiskey brand. We had an ancestor known as Walter Teeling who operated just down the road from where our current whiskey distillery is. So we wanted to get as close as possible to that whiskey distillery. So five years down the line, 
very much still involved in the company, going strength to strength to strength and uh, an honor to work for. So, yeah, we're going to jump on into the actual distillery. So this is like a very nerdy uh, kind of video game in a way. Uh, you can do little cheats. So we're going to jump through to the mill. So we set up this distillery to be as state-of-the-art, liquid-led, and flavor-forward as possible. So where those whiskey come from, in essence, I suppose just the easiest way to explain this is how do we get from our grain all the way to the liquid that's in your glass? And it all comes down to the preservation of crops. So people had too much barley. What they did is they brewed it into beer. Then they had too much beer and they brewed it into whiskey. The same goes for grapes, wine, and cognac, and same goes for uh, apples, cider, and calvados. It's uh, preserving your crop and intensifying flavors. So in Ireland, we start off with barley. And you can see two different styles of barley here. So this stuff here is malted barley and this stuff here is unmalted barley. So why do we use barley? So barley is a source of sugar. We need sugar to feed to our yeast to create alcohol. So the barley will unlock that sugar and the potential of the yeast. But barley will also provide a lot of different flavors, a lot of different oils, character, texture, and body to our whiskey. Um, so... We use two different styles predominantly. We use malted barley and unmalted barley. So malted barley is your barley that has been steeped. It's been heated up. It's had all the sugars converted uh, in it, and they're now accessible to the yeast. But we also use this stuff here. It's a little bit lighter. This is unmalted barley. So unmalted barley is not converted. It hasn't had the starches broken down into those accessible sugars and this is a very historic style of dublin whiskey this is called single pot still whiskey this is when you combine the unmalted barley and the malted barley and the unmalted barley won't give you necessarily the yield it won't give you the alcohol but what it does give you is oiliness it gives you character and it gives you a spiciness and uh something that's unique to ireland and uh yeah, we make single pot still whiskey here in Newmarket Square. We also make peated whiskey, as you may have heard. Uh, peated whiskey, what we do is we actually use peat to dry out the barley here. And those kind of phenols get trapped in the barley, which carries through into the whiskey that's in your glass. Um, Alex Chasco, our master distiller and master blender, having a background in the craft beer industry, um, looks at every single aspect of production for flavor. And this goes down to the grains as well. So from his experience in the craft beer industry, we are looking at some speciality malts, such as roasted malts, cho uh, chocolate and crystal and uh, crystal rye, and seeing how they can bring unique and uh, different flavors to the Irish whiskey industry. And they're quite exciting to see uh, what comes out of them. So... This is our wet mill. So we have a lovely picture here of our silos. They're not especially pretty to look at, but uh, we have very big silos at the back, which hold our grain. And what this is, is I like to describe this as essentially a massive coffee grinder. It grinds down our barley into a fine powder. And this powder is what we call grist. We have to have a fancy word to make ourselves kind of seem different in the distilling world, but essentially it's a uh, flour in a way. It's a higher surface area so you can extract more sugar, more flavor, more oils and character from the barley. Uh, it's also a wet mill, so it actually steeps our barley before we grind it down, and that increases our yield and allows us to be a little bit more flexible in what we actually produce here in Newmarket Square. So our grist will come over to here, and this is called our lauder ton. So this is where we add water to our grist and churn it around. What happens is we mix the whole mixture together, all of the sugars, the oils, the flavor goes into the liquid and that's what we will collect. Anything that's left over in this, uh, we actually sell to the animal feed industry. It's incredibly nutritious. It's incredibly uh, important for uh, livestock. So what we collect is this rich barley flavored, sugary, flavorsome liquid, which we call wort. Um, this comes out of that at about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. Um, 
we, we actually cool it down because if we add yeast to that liquid at that temperature, it will uh, kill all the yeast. So we actually have to pass it through a wort cooler, which will uh, strip away all the heat, send that heat somewhere else in the distillery. So we have our wort. We haven't started making alcohol yet. Uh, so we're going to go to fermentation. So these are our fermentation tanks here. So the process fermentation is really easy. Uh, basically, yeast is a monocellular organism and it loves sugar. So it will go to sugar, it will eat it up, it will multiply and it will produce carbon dioxide, which is the fizz almost in your beer. It's, uh, it will also produce flavor, about three to 4,000 different styles of flavor. And it will also produce alcohol and that's what we want. So we want high ABV spirit. So we want to raise up our ABV as high as possible. So we use a particular strain of yeast called distilling yeast, which does that. It ramps up our ABV to 8% after about three to five days, depending on our schedule. And this distilling yeast is highly aggressive, really, really efficient at what it does. But we want not only efficiency, we also want flavor. We want to get flavor into every aspect of production. So what we actually use is South African white wine yeast. So we trialed about about 10 to 15 different varieties of yeast and we settled on the South African white wine yeast. This yeast will give us a lot of exotic fruits, a lot of orchard fruits into the actual batch. It's not as efficient as the distilling yeast, but it's finding that balance between efficiency and flavor will give us a flavorsome product. As you can see as well, we actually use two different styles of fermenters here. So we use the Oregon pine and we use the stainless steel fermenters back here. So I'm going to look into the Oregon pine. You can see some, uh, what, well, beer, uh, essentially, uh, bubbling away in there. Uh, these are very traditional style of fermenters. So these are Douglas fir, Oregon pine. They're 15,000 liters each in size. And um, this is where our wort spends its first day with the yeast. So if it spends its first day there. What's happening is all the yeast is gobbling up the sugar. It's releasing carbon dioxide. It's releasing flavor and it's releasing alcohol. But it is also interacting with the wood. So the wood will develop its own unique bacterial culture, its own unique yeast, which will impart flavors onto our batch that no one can recreate. And these flavors will develop over time. They will hone in, they'll become unique to our distillery here. So we fill in 15,000 liters and 15,000 liters and let it sit here for a day. And then we transfer them for a further couple of days in our 30,000 liters stainless steel tanks. And this is where everything's controlled. This is where we efficiently brew. So it's finding the balance between modern efficiency and traditional style techniques. So it's kind of having one foot in the past, but also looking forward in the future and finding the middle ground that gives us good flavored liquid and uh, is efficient as possible. So what comes out of it is a beer. Uh, it's not a very nice beer. Uh, it is about 8% ABV, very barley driven, very, very fruity, robust, oily, heavy. And this is what we want. We want big, bold, dominant flavors early on in the process so that later on in our spirit, we can get big, dominant flavors that are what we want. So we come to our pot stills here. So these are Alison, Natalie, and Rebecca. So uh, Jack Teeling has three daughters, and uh, they're named after his daughters. So from biggest and oldest to youngest and smallest. So not to them to hopefully one day in the future, they will take over the controls of these stills. So these are made in Italy. So these are coming from Frilly in uh, Siena in Italy. Uh, and they've traveled a long way to be here and they're very traditional style copper pot stills. So uh, we basically use copper for a number of reasons. So copper will remove sulfur. It will be incredibly efficient at conducting heat. It will allow chemical reactions to occur and will also shape easily because the shape of the still has a big impact on the flavor of your spirit. So what we do is we fill up our first still with 15,000 liters of wash and we heat it up. So alcohol and water 
different boiling points. Water boils at 100. We don't want the water, so we always keep the temperature below that. Alcohol boils at 78 degrees. We want that, so we always keep the temperature above 78. What happens when we keep the temperature in the middle is all of the alcohol vapors come up with a bit of water, but what they do is they carry up the flavors of the yeast and the barley up the still where they can interact with the copper. They can come up the neck of the still here and they can start refluxing, cooling down, heating back up again to develop new flavors, new textures. Eventually they'll get up here over the swan neck down to the line arm and they'll be condensed back down into a liquid. This be in around 27% ABV. So we go on to the next still. So in our middle still, we essentially do the exact same step again. Now, as you can see, the still is quite a bit smaller than our first still. It's actually 15,000 liters, 10,000 liters, and 9,000 liters. And that's because we leave a lot behind every time we distill. This is called pot ale. And again, it's not a waste. It's incredibly useful. It can be used as fertilizer or animal feed. It's another byproduct of the alcohol industry that can be repurposed. So in the middle still, do the exact same step again. Heat it up, allow those alcohol vapors to come up, dropping as much flavor as possible with it and carrying it up the still. And what we do is we leave as much water and the stuff we don't want behind. So those alcohol vapors come up, they reflux, they condense back down into a liquid anywhere around 70% ABV. And this is double distilled. So this would be uh, heavy in malt flavors. It'd be a little bit kind of a big body, really oily uh, character to it. But what's interesting about this is that we don't actually take everything that comes off this still. So we take what's known as cuts and every kind of distillery will have different levels of cuts depending on what style of flavor, what style of product that they want. Uh, and the cuts don't go to waste, they're actually recycled. So keep putting them back in the next time we run the still and you cherry pick all of the good stuff from it, all of that ethanol, all of those good flavors, leaving behind all of the bad alcohols and all of the kind of unwanted flavors that you want. So it's, um, it's a very precise art uh, taking your cuts on the still. So in Teelings, we predominantly triple the still. So this is why we have Rebecca, our third still. And basically we do the exact same step again. We uh, heat it up, allow the alcohol vapors to come up, leaving as much water as possible. What happens in this is you further refine the spirit. You take away the kind of big, heavy, bold, in your face flavors. And what happens when you do that is you allow lighter, easier, more approachable flavors to come through. And those flavors would be very reminiscent of yeast. So our white wine yeast would be allowed to flourish through this. And if we're using unmalted barley, that would be allowed to come through. So what comes off this is a clear liquid. It's around 82% ABV. Uh, some people call it putchine or new make. Uh, it's clear, but it's bursting with oils, bursting with spice from the unmalted barley, and really, really fruity as well from that lovely white wine yeast. And this is what we're going to put into the cask to become whiskey. So we're going to jump up to maturation. So we don't mature everything on site here in Newmarket Square. And the reason for that is we have a lot of casks and it's just not a good idea to have that many casks in a city center environment. We do, however, mature some casks in here in Newmarket. And what you can see are the Zoe and the Holly Teeling casks. So they are Stephen Teeling's two daughters. So five girls inheriting the company. And they missed out in a pot still because they were uh, born after the distillery opened. But they get a cask of whiskey uh, when they turn 21. So uh, we also have here in the middle, this is the single pot still batch one. So this is the first batch of whiskey that we actually made here. So this has come here as a grain delivery. We milled it, lauded it, fermented it, distilled it three times and aged it here in Dublin. And this was the first Dublin distilled whiskey in nearly 50 years. So something that we're really, really happy to have. And it's great that we now have more whiskeys coming online over the coming uh, months and years. So to be Irish whiskey, uh, what is the legislation? So one, you have to be distilled in Ireland for three. Uh, you have to be distilled in Ireland and you have to be aged in Ireland for three years. 
uh, very t- uh, similar to the Scottish law. But ultimately, a big difference in the Irish whiskey uh, legislation comes from what is this. So in a lot of countries in America, it's a brand new fresh oak barrel if you're making bourbon. In Scottish, it is uh, oak barrels. And in Irish law, it is a wooden barrel. So you can use whatever type of wood that you would like. So we've experimented with lots of different varieties of non-oak species like chestnut or acacia uh, and what they can impart in on whiskey is incredible and i think is an amazing prospect for the irish whiskey industry to explore these non-oak species so what we have here is our barrel so we need it in there for three years to uh age before we can legally call it whiskey uh see completely clear liquid would be about 200 220 liters in size how does it get from this to this so thermodynamics Basically, things get bigger when they're warmer, things get colder, uh, smaller when they're colder. So it gets into the wood, picks up the flavor of the wood and or the previous product that was in there. And will also pick up the kind of oxygen as well, which will oxygenate it, will allow flavors to mellow out, to kind of relax and create a nice, smooth, approachable product. So three years down the line, we are here. So you can see we've picked up about 100% of the flavor, uh, looking at about 60% of the, sorry, 100% of the color, about 60% of the flavor. So this is legal Irish whiskey. Uh, you can see we've lost quite a bit. So you lose about 12% in Ireland. That's called the angel share. So 2% a year uh, off into the atmosphere. You uh, It's inevitable. Um but you also lose around 5% just for putting it into the barrel. It's called equilibrium. Uh, we put something that's highly volatile into an organic wooden vessel. It's, it needs time to mellow out. So when we're kind of aging, uh, three years is the minimum, but we go by flavor. We don't go by, okay, it's four years. Uh, that's when it comes out. We'll go to our barrels all the time, taste them, analyze them, and we'll take them out when they reach the age that we want. An example of a very old whiskey would be this, which is a a vintage reserve whiskey that's in the family reserve stock. And this is 30 years plus. So you can see that the angel share has been huge. We've lost well over half to evaporation. I'd say that's nearly bordering on two thirds. Um, So when you were drinking those whiskeys, of course, that loss has to be accounted. That's years of management, lab testing, uh, analysis, mining, duties, that, all that. Um, But from a flavor perspective, what's interesting with these really old whiskeys is the flavors used to have uh, 200 liters to swim around in this. Now they probably only have about 80 to 90. So that's why they're compacted more. The volume's gone, but the flavor is still there. So some of these whiskeys are like almost drinking butter um, the longer you age them. So number one style of cask we use would be uh, similar to these, would be ex-bourbon casks. Uh, they're readily available. They're really good at aging spirit. Uh, they give lovely notes of vanilla, honey, caramel, uh, kind of clove spice and nice oaky tannin in there and a beautiful straw yellow color. But we age in lots of different styles of barrels. So we would age in Port, Madeira, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, white burgundy, uh, rum barrels, lots of different styles, agricole rums, pineapple rums. Um, we've done uh, sauterne barrels, gin barrels, barley wine, stout, uh, you name it, we probably have whiskey aging in it. And that is us as whiskey makers really want to find different sources of flavor and bring new characteristics to Irish whiskey. Uh, the consequence of using these unique uh, barrels is uh, this is an example of our small batch our flagship whiskey you'll notice a large amount is gone from it and that comes from the bourbon and transfer to rum maturation we lose about 25 percent of our entire batch of whiskey uh, from transferring and tasting and uh, leakage and that and that's okay because in small batch whiskey maturation and production, uh, flavor is key. So if you lose some, you definitely gain on flavor. So we're always going to be a flavor forward, uh, liquid lead uh, whiskey distillery. But uh, yeah, guys, uh, I 
Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if Again, if you have any questions, uh, please ask away. Uh, type into the live chat. I'll be on there or one of the other brand ambassadors or sales teams or that or Jack and Stephen and Alex will be there to uh, answer any of your questions. But uh, thank you very much, guys. And uh, yeah, salam, Jeff.